of the Triffids. I watched that silly, very low-tech movie when I was 12 years old. I know. Seeing Ray Comfort is far scarier than the Triffids. But it's Halloween. Time for a bit of scary. So let's take a look at why some people turn Triffids into horror films, but Ray Comfort sees them as proof of his God. We are looking at Ray Comfort's video, This One Plant Proves God's Existence. What will the plant do? Will it preach? Will Jesus appear in the plant the way he has on toast? Will the plant open up to reveal Jesus' second coming, like Thumbelina emerging from the flower? Let's find out. Let's have a chat. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me and especially to my patrons and channel members. Let's see if Ray Comfort is now hearing his plants talk. I've just discovered that it seems they got their inspiration from one special plant in nature. The Venus flytrap is one of the best known of these plants. Can you think of a plant that proves God's existence? This is typical Ray Comfort, finding a person on the street and asking them something they have never considered. But really, it's not a good question. It's an absurd question. I think the video would have been better if Antonio, Ray doesn't identify his name until the end of the video, so I had to go back and edit it into my script after I finished my reactions. If Antonio had given him a response like this, That's a good question. I do not think I can give you an answer to that right now. Have you ever studied the Venus flytrap? Not studied it, no. And this is the only reasonable answer to an absurd question like that. Here's the take of Mage Grey Wolf from the channel Gardens Happen. Hello, I'm the voice behind the channel Gardens Happen. My channel isn't about atheism or debunking religious claims. As the name implies, my channel is about gardening. I'm welcoming to anyone, and regardless of your religious or political views. I do like to inject science in my videos whenever possible, and the subject of evolution is one that is particularly interesting to me. When Godless Granny reached out to me to help her research the Venus flytrap, I couldn't help notice Ray seemed to be arguing meaning that the Venus flytrap was irreducibly complex. So far in nature, nothing that we've found can be said to be irreducibly complex, including the Venus flytrap. Every part of the Venus flytrap could have been repurposed from having a different function, or have developed as a means of, of more simplistic methods of capturing insects. For instance, the flytrap could have evolved from a plant that first developed hairy leaves. These hairs, which are specialized epidermal cells, are used by non-carnivorous plants in a variety of ways. They reduce water loss, help with thermal regulation, and protect the plant from insect attacks. It would have taken little or no alteration to these hairs for them to trap water droplets, which in turn could trap have insects in the surface tension of the water. Once the droplet had evaporated, the remains could have fallen to the ground feeding the plant, or the plant could have absorbed the nutrients directly through the leaves through a form of folio or feeding. Further modification and would allow the plant to produce a substance that could attract and to even trap the insects by themselves. This isn't all that uncommon for plants as they usually use this method for pollination rather than in catching in the insects. A plant that could fold its leaves in and through the touch which would make it even more efficient at capturing insects. This isn't the only function in folding leaves would have though, such as with the Mimosa pudica, also known as a sensitive plant, or touch-me-not. This plant uses its folding leaves as a means of, of protecting them from water loss, or possibly from being eaten. Finally, the plant could have repurposed proteins used as a means of disease resistance. These proteins combine and form enzymes that could break down on the insect, so really nothing about the Venus flytrap could be said to be irreducibly complex or not have a function without the other parts. Thank you, Mage Grey Wolf. And here's an interesting tip that I picked up from looking into the Venus flytrap. It is the only member of its genus, Diania. Its family is Drosericae, carnivorous plants. There are only three genera, Diania, Eldravanda, and Drosera, that are classified as Drosericae. The waterwheel plant is the only member of the genus Aldravanda. It sounds like a Harry Potter spell. 
with the remaining 178 carnivorous plants as being Drosera. That said, if every family of plant and animal had to be on Noah's boat to survive the flood, how did a genus of plant end up living only in North and South Carolina? If this was a divine plan, it sounds like it was made up by a committee, and letting this species exist at all might have been a point of compromise. If you watch the Venus flytrap videos online, you'll find a number of them showing flies getting caught and eaten by this plant. Oh, hey, Ray may actually be onto something here. The Venus flytrap lures its victims with what looks and smells like a flower, but when an insect lands on it looking for food, it touches the highly sensitive hairs on the leaves, triggering the trap. Yes, yes, I see it. This is just like the Christian God. He set out the fruit in the middle of the garden, made it a delight to the eye, but really it was a trap for Adam and Eve. So when they ate of the fruit, it triggered this highly sensitive God who had set up this trap. So now God can punish them for eternity in a manner similar to the plant slowly digesting a trapped insect over a period of three to seven days. And since then, people continue to fall into this trap as even a single lie, as Ray is so wont to point out, triggers the trap laid out by God for humans. So God can now devour them. Yes, Ray. Yes, it is all so clear now. Thank you. Uh, but doesn't this just get you to a God that deceives people into falling into his trap? Is this really proof of the God that you want? If so, you did a good job of illustrating your God, but who would want such a God? It sounds like a weed that we would want to rid ourselves of. No, no, not that weed. We'll keep that one. But few give details about the amazing design of the plant, let alone give credit to the designer. Oh, that wasn't what you were going for. You were just seeing a design in the plant because... reasons? This is just a look at the trees argument, except you substituted look at the fly trap. Famous evolutionary believer and commentator David Attenborough tells us how it all began. It began in the sea some 3,000 million years ago. Complex chemical molecules began to clump together to form microscopic blobs. And this first blob, thanks to a magical 3,000 million years of time, evolved into this incredibly complex life as we know it. Not only evolving into you and I, but also into the amazing Venus flytrap. Listen now to David Attenborough talk about what actually happens when a fly lands on these plants. But notice, as usual with all his nature videos, he unbelievably doesn't give God the slightest credit for his unspeakably creative hand. Why would he? There is no hand of God seen in the process that Dave Attenborough describes. That you are able to impose one because you presuppose that there is such a designer doesn't change the fact that Attenborough didn't see that invisible hand that you claim to see. This fly has to tread carefully. If it strikes one hair, it can carry on feeding, but a timer has been set. The New York Times called the Venus flytrap a plant that can count. Can someone please explain to Ray that the New York Times did not mean this literally? You know how Matt Powell takes headlines from articles and manages to misunderstand them? Yeah, you could, you could type in on Google right now when monkeys surfed, and you'll find that monkeys made a voyage 34 million years ago from Africa to South America. I could see him now claiming atheists think that plants can count, while simultaneously Ray here would be contending that the plant's ability to count is evidence of being designed by a person capable of counting. It just goes to show, take anything, literally anything, like the amount of time it takes a Venus flytrap to close, and Ray will find that as a reason to think that God designed it, while Matt Powell will take that same evidence and claim it shows how stupid atheists are. We atheists have so much work to do. A second strike in less than 20 seconds, and the fly is doomed.
first hair sets off a timer, touches the second hair, that trap comes down at the speed of lightning and devours the insect. This is not accurate. The speed of lightning is the same as the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, or 300,000 kilometers per hour. The Venus flytrap closes in 0.3 seconds. It's fast, but not the speed of light. To travel at the speed of light in 9 tenths of a second, lightning would travel 90,000 kilometers. And I don't believe there are any 90,000 kilometer long flytraps out there. If there were, they would swallow whole cities and not just whole flies. Then we really would have the makings of a horror film. Also, the reason for this timer effect would be to prevent it from closing on things like water droplets that could trigger the plant if only one hair was touched. If it didn't develop this mechanism, it could be wasting much valued resources, which it needs since the plant became carnivorous in the first place due to growing in places with poor nitrogen and phosphorus. Plants that might not have had this timer would have been outcompeted by those that did. Thank you to Mage Grey Wolf for that tidbit as well. Did you know that? I did not know that. Yeah, it's incredibly well designed. I mean, if, if we had a scientist design a machine that did that, we'd be in awe. So the design proves the designer. Actually, we have plenty of machines that move faster than this. How does the speed that the plant closes prove that you have a design? Once again, you assume a design from what nature has awesomely made on her own. And incidentally, lots of things in nature are not awesome. Many things, like the pharyngeal nerve or parasites, if they are from a designer, would be from a poor designer indeed. This is the fatal flaw of the intelligence design argument. If you claim that nature is designed, then you must own up to all of the poor aspects of nature as being designed that way by your God. Ray makes this natural process sound like a decision-making process. The trigger of the hairs being disturbed no more causes the plant to decide to secrete digestive juices than does the smell of food cause you to decide to salivate. It's a natural response that evolved in the system. Not only does the plant count, it actually calculates. When the trigger hairs were touched further, it signaled to the plant to produce digestive juices. As the trap fly struggled, the plant determined the amount of digestive juices needed to dissolve it. It not only produced digestive juices when they were needed, but it only produced the amount that was needed. That's cool. Nature found a way to signal the plant as to how much digestive juice to make. Watch now as this man firstly draws his own mini version of the fly trap and then note the complexity of the process needed to make it a reality. Ask yourself if this relatively simple machine could have made itself without an intelligent designer. A machine? No, because machines are man-made things, and man-made things do require people to make them. But a plant? No, it doesn't need a designer. In fact, if the plant was designed, it's certainly possible to trap flies with fewer parts and less effort like with this, or this. Either of these would have been far simpler. A simpler design would have fewer possible problems. David Attenborough became a household name in 1979 with his groundbreaking BBC series, Life on Earth, which was seen by an estimated 500 million people worldwide. I can't help thinking uh, of when I have, for example, taken off the, the top of a termite hill and I've seen termites in there, um, all busying about um, building walls, looking after the queen, caring for the pupae, clearing the nest, all busy about it. Then they're all blind and they have the faintest idea that I am there watching what they're doing because they don't have those sense organisms which would allow them to know that. And I do sometimes feel that maybe I'm lacking in some sense organ that I don't know 
whether there's anybody else involved in all this sort of thing. With all due respect, sir, the only sense you're lacking is common sense. Well, that certainly is a bizarre conclusion from what he said. Ray, of course, needs to appeal to common sense because evidence of God doesn't exist in any other sense. God can't be seen, heard, felt, smelled, or tasted. So since God cannot be experienced in any way that relates to reality, he must be appealed to by common sense. You just know. Common sense is defined as sound and prudent judgment based on a simple perception of the situation or facts. Considering that nothing about God can be discovered through simple perception, how can one possibly have any common sense about God? It is true that all civilizations have stories about gods, so the idea of a god is a common idea. But that a god designed the Venus flytrap cannot be a matter of common sense, as such a thing cannot be perceived, not unless one concludes it first and then perceives the flytrap within that preconceived worldview. So Ray provides confirmation bias to the already convinced. God made this because I don't see how it could exist otherwise, all the while ignoring the very people who are telling him how it could exist otherwise. God gave you eyes to see his incredible creation, and he gave you a brain to realize that it's utterly impossible for the complexity of this creation to happen without an intelligent designer. As the Book of Romans says, you are without excuse. And once again, we have the look at the trees verse that claims that invisible things are clearly seen. It's right there in front of your face. Why can't you see it? Because it's invisible? Yes, that's why you have to look with your common sense, not with your eyes. It's clearly visible to see, provided you don't use your eyes to look. Yes, that makes perfect sense. Do you ever read the Bible? Um, when I was younger, I read a few scriptures, a few um, words in Bible study and in church, but um, not, I, I didn't absorb all of it. Let me say it like that. I love Antonio's rainbow sunglasses. I wonder if they're a pride symbol. I wonder if they're why Ray singled him out. Postscript edit here. It is. Antonio identifies as gay and queer. Thank nice you. of you to listen to me. You've said that you're gay. Did you say you identify as queer? Yes. Isn't that direct? Are you afraid of death? Not necessarily. Good answer. This isn't the scripted answer that Ray usually gets. Oh, you should be. You should be afraid of anything that can kill you. Ray tells Antonio that he gave the wrong answer. I have a script and you need to stick to it. But then Ray changes the question to something that anyone would agree with. You should be afraid of anything that can kill you. True. But that doesn't mean that you fear death. I fear dying, but I don't fear death. Unfortunately, Ray won't give the man much time to realize that he has changed the question. Do you think Antonio will pick up on it anyways? He's pretty sharp. Well, that can kill me, yes, but, but death, yeah. is, death is going to kill you. Cool. He did pick it up. But Ray cuts him off. There's a jump cut here. I wish I could get the footage that came next. I'll back this up a bit so you can see how Ray edits out Antonio's response. Death is going to kill you. You know, I would say that I have a pretty good relationship to um, this higher power or higher being, like a collective energy that is kind of influenced by a multiplicity of things. And if it's um, that is influenced by and that continues to influence multiple things in this world. So Antonio believes in spiritual influence, but not a personal deity. He is part of the largest segment of those who profess no religion. So how are you going to do on Judgment Day? Are you a good person morally? I would like to think I am. By what standard do you judge yourself? I try to treat people the way that I would like to be treated. That's, you're quoting Jesus there, where he said, do to others as you'd have them do to you. That's mm -hmm. the, what we call the golden rule, and it's the essence of the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And Jesus copied this from other spiritual leaders and philosophers, as he wasn't the one that came up with this idea. It also isn't the essence of the Ten Commandments. The first four are about honoring God. They aren't even about treating God the way you want to be treated. I mean, I don't want to be worshipped or have a day dedicated to honoring me. I'm fine with art. 
no need to limit art to not depicting anything in nature. Honoring your parents is good, not murdering is good, but lying? Some lies are good. If you want to treat other people like you'd be treated, you don't lie to them, don't steal from them, don't commit adultery with his wife, don't fornicate, you do that which is right. So, let's go to the Ten Commandments and see how you're going to do on Judgment Day, those Ten Commandments. How many lies have you told in your life? And now we are back to Ray's usual script. He always has a way to get back to his script. Oh, I've lost count, unfortunately. So what do you call someone who's told multiple lies? Society would call them a liar. So what are you? Um, I have lied. I wouldn't say that I am a liar. That's the best answer I've heard to Ray's question. My response would have been that the question is dishonest, as it calls for a lie for an answer. Since no person can know everything they have ever said, whether or not it was true at the time that they said it, and whether or not they knew it was true at the time that they said it, any numerical answer to the question would not be a truthful answer. And since the question asks for a numerical answer, there is no truthful numerical answer to the question. The question seeks a lie for its answer, and thus is a dishonest question. But his response that a person who has told lies is not necessarily a liar is accurate. Lying is part of human nature. This is why I find this part of the script to be a condemnation of God more than anyone else. If lying is part of human nature, which Ray would likely agree with, as this is how he knows he can get people to admit to this, all people have done it. But if Ray is right that God makes people, and that God decided what human nature is, then to condemn humans for being what God made them to be is unjust, not to mention malicious. One has to ask, did God make people with a nature that he would condemn them for having because he enjoys watching humans be tortured for eternity? Or is he so stupid that he couldn't see that this would be the result? If so, your God would have to be a complete moron as he keeps making people with this nature that he then condemns them for. It's like your God is an out-of-control serial killer that can't help but continue to make and destroy humans. If this God was real, what kind of person would worship this God? Fortunately, this God is not real. If you just stop believing in him, he isn't there because he was never there in the first place. He was only in your imagination. Don't believe that? A few of the Bible authors, it seems, realized this even as they wrote it, that the magic of God depends on human belief in it, just like pixie dust. Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Sure. Have you had sex outside of marriage? Sure. So here's a summation. I'm not judging you. This is for you to judge yourself. And again, with the questions that are human nature, it's funny that Ray then says he's not judging the man, but then he does exactly that. He claims he wants the man to judge himself, but he wants him to use Ray's standard to use it. How is judge yourself by my standard any different from this is my judgment. Mm -hmm. You've told me you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, fornicating, adulterer at heart who's self-righteous and saying you're a good person when you're not. You're like the rest of us. So here's the big question. Oops, my bad. I thought Ray was going to do what he said he was going to do. Instead, he says he won't judge the man himself, but then he does exactly that. Ray, how many lies have you told? If God judges you by those Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, you're going to be innocent or guilty. I think it's a little more complicated. It is? That's one of the best answers that I've heard to Ray's script. I'm surprised Ray left that in. I hope Antonio is going to point out that we have no reason to think that there is a God that is going to judge people for how they lived up to the Ten Commandments. No verse in the Bible even makes that claim. Tell me why. I have tried my best to um, atone for anything that I... Um, felt in my heart was something I should be atoning for. And that I measure that in many different ways. And I think that those factors are going to be considerable at the end, not necessarily just our past doings, but also how we set intention forward to becoming a better person. Those things I don't think are things that are often um, considered, but I do think they are a part of the larger story. A very good answer. It assumes that there is a God 
and that God is a reasonable person who will judge fairly based on the whole picture. That makes sense. What doesn't make sense is Ray's view, a God that looks solely at insignificant points in the full picture of a person's life to pinpoint where they acted in accordance with the nature that God gave them and then condemn them for those points. Antonio clearly has a much better God than Ray does, a kind God, not a judgmental monster that is out for blood. Let me reason with you for a moment. Mm -hmm. Imagine you're, you're in a court of law and mm -hmm. you've committed very serious crimes. Let's say you robbed a bank and shot a guard. Mm -hmm. Judge says you're guilty and you say, yes, I am guilty, uh, Judge, but I want to tell you, please take in the big picture. I've done some good things. I'm going to improve myself in the future. And the judge is going to say, well, what are you talking about? This is a court of law. Justice works by punishment of crimes. I'm not going to judge you on your good works. I'm judging you solely on the crime, and that's the way God works also. Couple problems with this analogy. First, the crimes Ray wants this man to admit to aren't serious acts. Most lies don't harm anyone. Some even protect people. Lust doesn't harm anyone. To compare these to violent offenses isn't comparing apples to oranges. It's comparing apples to ghosts. Second, in your analogy, the next thing that should happen is the judge decides to sentence his own son to be hanged in the place of the criminal. In what world is this just? Will the victim's families now be relieved that the judge's son is dead and that the murderer goes free? What kind of cockamamie system of justice is this? If the judge has any more children, those children should run for their lives. The Ten Commandments are called the moral law. You and I broke the law. Jesus paid the fine in full. Mm -hmm. If you're in court and someone pays your fine, if you've got speeding fines, someone pays them, the judge will let you go even though you're guilty. He'll say, you're out of here, someone's paid this fine. Ray's script always turns from the death sentence to a monetary fine when the analogy goes to Jesus paying the price for your sins. Because he knows if he keeps the analogy consistent, that the judge sentences the murderer to death, then kills his own son instead, it is neither justice nor mercy. Sentencing his son to death wasn't just. Letting the murderer go wasn't just. God showed no mercy to the victims of the crime or to his son. Not only is the judge a fool, if he keeps judging guilty people, he's going to run out of kids pretty quick. Then what happens? Does he come for yours? Fortunately for the story, the son turns out to be immortal, and he can recover pretty quickly from death. So there was no payment of wages for sin. No one died. Death got cheated. But the big head-scratcher is when you continue the analogy. The judge brings every person before him and asks if they believe that his son died for them. If they say yes, they get mercy. If they say no, they go to the eternal torture chamber making your thoughts the only basis for judgment. Not anything you did, only what you think about the judge's story. Further, if you say you believe the story, but you don't really believe it, the judge will see your heart and know that you are faking belief, so you still go to the eternal torture chamber, making the basis for mercy what you are convinced of, something over which you have no control. Don't believe me that you can't control what you are convinced of? Try to tell yourself that 2 plus 2 is 5. Can you honestly say that you can make yourself believe that? If what we are convinced of depends entirely on the evidence we are presented for that fact or that idea, and our eternal lives depend on our being convinced, and a loving God cares about your being convinced, why is this loving God not doing anything to convince us? He sent Ray Comfort to do it for him? The banana man? If Ray is the best that God can do to make his story convincing, then the Bible redemption story is just another ghost story to lure people into the fly trap. Sin is like a Venus fly trap. It attracts us. And God's given us a time of grace. I mean, we've triggered that here the moment we sinned, and you've got a certain amount of time to get out before the jaws come down on Judgment Day. Let's look at that analogy. In this analogy, the fly is humans, and sin is the fly touching the hair that triggers the trap. Okay, what is the trap? 
It's God's law. It's God's law that supposedly traps you for your sin, and then the judgment is the trap devouring you. Who is supposed to be the judge? God. So God is the one who sets up the trap and the one who devours you if the trap is triggered. And this is a good God because he made a way for you to escape the trap? Seriously, Ray, I think you should think through your analogies before setting up your God as lying in wait to devour those unwary of his trap. The trap is the trick. Life is the treat. Stay clear of the trap. Have a happy Halloween and live your life.